let's talk for a minute about jump scares. I know I've probably gone over this maybe several times, but it bears repeating because uh, some of you will think this is splitting hairs, but uh, it helps to know why they are as stupid as they are. It helps to know, uh, it helps to understand, it helps you to understand how cinema works, how the human mind works and how you get invested in a movie, like a horror movie or a comedy, stuff like that. Um, jump scares are the lowest form of horror. They are the, they're the equivalent of the pie in the face of comedy. It's, it's what you do, it's, it's the basis level of fright, okay? Uh, it's, it's the mark of extraordinarily weak storytelling. When you can't think of something scary to do, when you can't think of a good way to set an atmosphere, you simply have something very quickly lurch out at the, at the camera, accompanied by a absolutely deafening, uh, or at least deafening in contrast to the very quiet action uh, of what's going on in the scene. All of a sudden, there's a huge orchestra sting, and you leap out of your seat, and you're like, oh my god, that was scary. Here's the thing, though. It's not scary. It's startling. It's like... <laughs> See that wasn't that wasn't scary, that was startling. That's not horror. That is me just grabbing your ear and yelling into it very loudly. That's not horror. That doesn't take any talent. Now, that's not to say that jump scares don't have their place. They do, because the pie in the face is funny. You know, it's it's funny watching someone get humiliated. It doesn't take any talent to throw a pie in the face, but it's funny. You know, I can't deny that, uh, you know, you, you'd get a laugh out of seeing that. But there's a rate of diminishing returns when it comes to the pie in the face uh, or the jump scare. Now, as with Family Guy, there is kind of a, there's a, there's almost like a, a, a sine wave where you can actually drive the gag so far into the ground and torture it and torture it and torture it to where it just kind of becomes pathetically funny, but that's not what I'm talking about. Um, when it comes to the jump scare, there's only a certain number of times you can do it before it becomes irritating. And the I think what a lot of people misunderstand is that you can be scared of a movie, but it's not because you're scared of the movie. It's because you're simply scared of the loud noises. You know what I mean? You're, you're, you're really not wanting to see the movie, but it's not because you're scared. It's because there's going to be another loud fucking noise, and I, it, I'm going to jump because it scares the... It's, it's, it, if I yelled in your ear, you'd, you'd freak the fuck out. You'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? But you'd be pissed. If I kept doing it, you'd be pissed off. So... You can do it, and it's scary, but you can only do it once, twice, maybe three times. And here's the key. It's actually better, far better, when you do it only twice. Because when you do it twice, you're a f that's where the fear comes from. When you show restraint, and you make those scares, you make them worth it. You make those scares where anything could leap out at you at any time, but it doesn't, and it doesn't, and it doesn't, and it doesn't, and then it does! That's where the payoff comes, you know? So, this is where I'm coming from when I say uh, jump scares are terrible. And if you're going to do them, only do them a few times. Now, this leads into the two movies I saw this week. Sinister and Paranormal Activity 4. I was really expecting to like Paranormal Activity 4, so I had this whole bit kind of planned out in my head where I was going to talk about one and the other. Turns out they're both kind of in the same boat, in the sense that they are both utterly and completely reliant on jump scares. Um, I guess I'll get to Sinister later, because I'm sure, I think most of you guys want to hear my thoughts on Paranormal Activity, so, okay. Um, suffice to say that... Uh, I was hearing bad things about Paranormal 4, but I was expecting that. I was expecting... Uh, a lot of people aren't in the Paranormal Activity boat. Uh, I am. So I've always been a mark for the series, much like 
uh, I don't like the Saw series, and I, I don't think critics like the Saw series at all. But if you're if you're invested in the series, you're pretty much hooked. You know, every time there's going to be a Saw movie, you're going to go see it. Like like Cinema Snob, you know. I don't even really think he likes the movies anymore, but he got four deep into it. He got four movies into the series. It's like, I gotta see how it ends, you know. And he liked the first bunch, so... You're like, you know, maybe they'll catch the lightning in a bottle again, and they'll do it again. So he kind of sat through them. It, it was almost an obligation. Now, it was an obligation for me with Paranormal Activity. I liked them. I liked the first three, even when people said it kind of went too far. Uh, but, no, I dug them. And this... Paranormal Activity 4 sucks. It sucks astonishingly bad. And this is coming from a guy who cut, you know, two and three slack. Everyone was saying, like, oh, it's repetitive. It stretched, you know, it stretched the premise to its limits. Stretch it beyond its limits. It's repetitive, you know. Um, I stuck up for it. And this is where the gimmick not only jumps the rails, it crashes into a school and explodes. It goes way too far. And here's why. I, I know I've said this before, but I have to explain why it doesn't work here. I've always said the Paranormal Activity series, uh, it's the only reason it's any good, only reason, and this goes with any found footage movie, only reason they work is because you could conceivably believe that the footage you're seeing is real. I'm not saying I do believe it. I'm not saying that you ever would. I'm saying you could see in this reality videos hitting the internet that are, like, you see this shit and you're like, oh my god, did that, like, you could, there's enough to hang your disbelief on that you could see something like this happening. You know, like, I, I, I'm digging a hole for myself here. Like, now, now I'm, I'm saying it, and I'm like, well, you'd never believe. You, you'd always think it was fake. I'm just saying, like, there's enough. It's grounded just enough in reality to where it's played straight. It's not played like a movie. You know, I guess I'm, I'm making some sense, but probably not. But I'm just saying, you look at this, and you're like, you know, this doesn't smack of uh, Hollywood. This doesn't seem like it was scripted. I could see this, you know, these people were reacting like I would think they would react. Uh, and even some people disagreed. I was on, I'm always on Team uh, uh, Mika. I'm, I'm on Team Mika because nobody liked him, but I was like, I am him. Um, but, uh, yeah. Th and I was with it for one. I was with it for two. I thought three. Three was where it started to lose me. And I like three. Um, but... It got to the point where three, uh, it, it three is based on these old VHS tapes that they found in the basement, and then they were stolen all of a sudden. And then we see the movie, which is these VHS tapes, and that's always one of the biggest problems in found footage movies: is who found the footage. And three, there's no answer to that. Like, th okay, these VHS VHS tapes got stolen, but. One presumes it was by the, the bad guys, or the cultists, or whatever you want to call them, in 3. So I'm like, how the fuck did these take... Like, who edited this footage? Who who released it in theaters? Because even Paranormal 1 and 2, you could kind of see... Like, you could kind of believe that these guys, you know, like the police, or some documentarians, or something like that, they got a hold of these tapes, and they put them together, and they're like, this is fucked up, just watch this, and... Like, this could be proof of the paranormal. Like, if you were to see that, you'd be like, wow, that's fucked up. But three, it's like, you know, like in one and two, they, 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 thank, they thank the families. They, they, they give their condolences to the families. They thank the police department for making the records available. You know, they go on, and, and until the credits roll, it's, it's presented almost like a memorial to these dead people. And that's what I mean when I say, I say they play it straight. They thank the press. They thank all these. And they're like, we, we, we have nothing but the deepest sympathies for the families here. We're just trying to figure out what happened. And so that, that's where I'm coming from when I say it, it's kind of real. Third movie, they throw it out the window. They're just like, uh, yeah, there was VHS tapes, and, and for some reason you are now seeing them. I'm like, how, who got these tapes? Where did they come from? Did the documentarians get these? But there's no, 
there's no bracketing. There's no, like, it used to be there's title cards. In fact, I don't even remember if there were title cards, like the ones that say, like, night one, night two, that kind of preface. There probably were, but I'm like, who, who did that? How did they get the tapes? I don't understand any of this. Um, now, just uh, as long as you're taking the ride, you're like, okay, this is interesting footage. But right there, a lot of the disbelief, it sounds silly, but the, that little thing, the little title cards, beginning and end, really help you hang your disbelief, you know. Um, and they're back here, you know. And, and it, but the, the weird thing is, it, it doesn't help anymore because things are so absurd. Things are so out of hand. Things are so fucking crazy in this movie that it goes beyond, like, it, it goes beyond, there's some unexplained, like, in the first one it goes like, you know, there's some unexplainable shit on this, on this footage, and maybe you can figure it out, I don't know. And then there's this movie, where it is absolutely batshit. There are people getting, like, there are people getting, like, grabbed by the ankles and swung into walls and the ceiling, there's people getting their necks snapped, like, like, fucking crazy. There's, like, a body count of, like, five people in this movie. And it's too much. You know, there's so much... If, if this movie were to hit theaters, and it were, like, a real documentary, um, there would be fucking riots, because this is, like, undeniable proof of the supernatural. You see fucking demons in this movie, you know? And it, that's what I mean when I say, like, you know, before it's this unseen menace... You know, you, you don't see anything. It, it could be, you know, it could be fake, but it might not be. And, you know, it's just enough weird stuff going on that you don't know. But now, there's this clearly malevolent force that is just straight up killing fuckers. You know, it's it's doing stuff like ripping chandeliers off the walls. It's like, it's, 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 ab it's absolutely crazy. And the worst part is it's all played like a movie. Um, th the editing is manipulative as shit. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out where to start. I guess I'll start from the beginning. A very good place to start. Um, what happens is they uh, there's a new family, okay? And there's this uh, teenage there's this teenage girl named Alex who's like 15. Who is pro by far the the strength of this movie is ironically the acting. It's very good. It's a shame the story sucks so bad, but the acting is great. Um, so she's very good. And what the, the thing happens is that uh, a new family moves in across the street, and it's it's Katie and the kid that she took from you know from number two. It's it's they never even make any bones about it. it's them. And the kid is acting like fucking Damien from The Omen. So much, like, it's... The kid is so fucking spooky, they might as well have just be... They might as well just literally play the music from The Omen every time that kid... Because the kid, like, stands in the middle of a park, just, like, staring. And it's like, oh, yeah, this you know. This kid is, like, so clearly the devil. And even the, even the characters... It, I, I almost think the, the actors were watching the shit going on, and they're like, even they couldn't, like, they, they must have, like, walked up to the director and be like, okay, there's no way that anyone normal would watch this kid and not be like, seriously, like, like pull each other aside and be like, are you fucking kidding me? This kid is Satan. It, like, it's, but nobody sees it. It's one of those movies where, like, the the two main characters are the only people who, like, clearly see this kid as possessed by De like fucking demons because the kid all but speaks in like fucking ancient Hebrew you know like hey uh hey I forget his name um Robbie they're like hey Robbie you want to come play football with us I am the vessel of the outer plane god as a toth yeah yeah Cthulhu for time you know like all but doing that the kid is like the the you know her and her boyfriend the boyfriend by the way best character in the movie this kid is awesome but, like, the, he, he spends the whole movie basically trying to get in her pants. You know, Alex's pants. And it's it sounds irritating, but it's not. He's really good. And it, well, what, what's also funny is, you know how I was saying, like, I identified with the first movie's character, Mika, where he was, like, a complete asshole. I mean, like, he's he's like, no, I want to get this on tape. I want to, I want to, and she's like, no, don't do it. No, I want to, I want to do it. Because, like, I said, I would totally be that guy. I My first thought upon seeing this shit was, like, I would put it on YouTube. Um... I would put it on YouTube. No, that's 
legitimately the first thing he says is like, oh, dude, I want to record this. Put it on YouTube, man. I'm like, yes. So I love that. Anyway, so he's, he's trying to find excuses to go on walks with her and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, you got a, you got a playground out here, right? Well, why don't we go up to the treehouse? You know, where, the, where the, the little kid is. And so he goes to the treehouse, and of course, for some reason, they got a fucking camera on him. So they go up to the treehouse, and he turns around, and sure enough, like, one of the first jump scares of the movie is the kid is just standing there, like, in the corner, staring blankly ahead. Like, this kid has been there for hours. You know, dead silent, not reacting to anybody climbing. It's just like... And, of course, everyone loses their shit. They're like, oh, my God! Rob, what the fuck are you doing here? And Robbie is just like... <sighs> Welcome, mortal. You know, like... It, like a fucking robot. It's like... it. It's, it's almost like the, the kid doesn't even move when he turns. He's just like... <sighs> Organic life form identified. You know. This kid's fucking crazy, right? So, like... I forgot where I was. Oh, the kid being clearly evil. So, like, that's just, like, one example of the kid all the time being just out of his fucking gourd. They, and this is what, the, all right, this is immediately where the movie starts falling apart. So, the uh, weird shit hasn't even started happening yet. And then, across the street, uh, there's ambulances in front of the, in, in front of the neighbor's house where Katie is. And they're like, Oh, Katie got sent to the hospital. So, Robbie, the kid over there, has nowhere else to stay because there's, pardon me, there's no relatives. He's got nowhere else to go. So, Robbie is going to be sleeping over with us. So, I'll just spoil it. For th this And this is one of the first things that makes no sense is Katie gets hauled off to the hospital. So, the kid has to stay over, but there's never any explanation for why Katie went to the hospital and had to stay inpatient, like, had to stay there for three or four days, you know, um, because hospitals won't just let you stay there, you know, and, and they even comment on this when Katie comes home from the hospital, the, the girl is, like, talking to her mom, and she's, she says, she looked fine. Like she, she didn't look like there was any reason for being for her to be in the hospital at all. Like there's no marks on her arms from where they might have put an IV. Uh, she looks fine, and like so that she comments like, "Why did she go to the hospital? She looks like she's always been fine." And nobody has an answer for this. And I'm like, "No, that's a question worth answering." Like, why did she get admitted to the hospital, and why was she? Why was she? kept inpatient for so long because that strange credulity of everyone at the hospital, you know, and you never get to see what happens on her end. And it's silly. Um, much less why, why Robbie would stay over for so long. Why nobody, I, I don't know. So yeah, the kid, the kid just acts bizarrely the whole time. Like the kid comes over and says hi to their kid and like, it's this really weird vibe between them where, like, he kind of shuffles over and then, like, holds his hand out. Like, I understand this is how you mortals greet one another. Like, really? It... <sighs> and the, the parents are, are the most maddeningly... This is, like, where... It... One of the biggest and worst cliches, and I'm going to say those words a lot, one of the biggest and worst cliches in horror movies are the idiot parents... You know what I'm talking about? Where clearly fucked up shit is happening in the house, but the parents are the only ones not to see it. And even when the kids try to explain to the parents that there's fucked up shit going on, they either don't listen or they conveniently interrupt the, the people before they can explain or something. But they never listen. They chalk it up to their imaginations or stress or just before they're about to show them What's going on? Something else happens, and they get pulled away. Like, the phone rings, and the, the kids are like, Damn it, I was gonna tell them, too. This is that turned up to 11. These are the dumbest parents. Okay, maybe not... The, I could probably come up with an example and give it an hour to think, but these are among the top two dumbest parents I've ever seen in a movie. Because even when 
clearly supernatural shit is happening to them, the dad in particular, they're just like, oh, you're overstressed. You're just, you, you, you're just, school is, you, you know, you, you're just a mad, you're not getting enough sleep, so you're seeing weird shit. I know you don't like the kid, but there's no reason to make this shit up. <sighs> okay, first off, maybe this is me. But if my kid came up to me and looked legit worried, and she, by the way, she's 15, like maybe a little kid might be making up an imaginary friend or noises that, you know, something goes bump in the night and the kid's like eight, I'd be like, look, you're seriously, like, just go to sleep. But when you get to 15 and she's like, dude, I saw a shadowy fucking figure in my closet or there is clearly something weird going on in this house, I'd look into it. You know, I wouldn't just, oh, it's stress, you don't like school, this kid is creeping you out. And it is, it, so like, even if you were to give them that, even if you were to give them, like, maybe she had attitude problems, she's done this before, she hasn't. But let's just say, like, worst case scenario, she's done this shit before. No, because there comes a point when the mom is, like, chopping vegetables, and she turns her back, and all of a sudden the knife, like, flies up out of camera shot and just stays there. Um, which is actually one of the better scares in the movie, because you're like, when is this knife going to drop? Is it going to, like, fucking impale someone or stick in their head? And it doesn't. Like, not right away. And honestly, they should have they should have held off on that longer, because that's what I'm saying when it comes to jump scares. You, it, I, I forget who said it, but there's, th there's, like, this example of, uh, it might have been Hitchcock, but there's, like, there's, there's a bomb under a table, and two people are sitting at the table, and real suspense is the bomb doesn't go off. So you're wondering when the bomb is going to go off. I, I'm bastardizing that quote completely, but that's what I mean. Is So, like, they could have held that knife up there for the better part of an hour, and that still would have been scary, because you're waiting for that knife to drop. And when the knife drops, it will be a jump scare, but it's earned, because you're waiting. you're not afraid of the noise, you're afraid of when that knife is going to drop because you know it's coming. And every time you get to that shot, you know, like, is this the, is this the scene? Uh, damn it. And, like, the scene passes, and you're like, no, that's not this. So it's got to come. It's going to come eventually. God, when is it going to happen? So, like, eventually the dad comes into the kitchen. It's late at night. He's hearing weird shit. He's fucking around. And all of a sudden, like, right in front of him, the knife goes, bam! The knife just, brrrr, you know, like, right where his hand was. And it's, like, vibrating there. And the dad's like... And you're like, oh, my God. You know, that, that almost killed him. And so, like, he, he's looking. He's like, where the fuck did that knife come from? And then he's, 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 he's legit freaked out. And he's, like, he starts to, like, tug on the knife. But the fucking knife is sunk into the counter, like, two inches. Like, clearly something, like, something weird. Like, fucking Bam like, buried that fucking knife in the counter. So he, like, has to, like, post down on the counter and, like, rip this thing out. I know, Oreo, it's scary. So he has to rip this knife out of the table. There is no rational explanation for this happening. You know, this is not like, like, how did the knife get up there? There's, like, even, there's nobody around that could have, like, rammed the knife into the counter. There's no reasonable explanation for the knife, like, hanging up there. I'm like, what, what happened? Did, did the mom, like put a thing of fishing line up there and hang it with a tack or in it. There's no reason for that. And so like after that scene, after that scene, he's just like, nothing happened, nothing. And when scary shit keeps happening to the girl and she comes running and screaming to her dad, like, Oh my God, something locked me in the garage and it started the car and it tried to kill me with carbon monoxide fumes. This happens, by the way. She's like, oh my God, oh my God. So I had to escape. And the only way I could think to escape because the doors wouldn't open was to jump in the car and throw it into reverse and crash through the garage door. And of course, before she can explain anything, before she can say, she's like, I got locked in the garage. And before she can get to like, and something was trying to kill me, I couldn't open the doors. And I had to get in the car. Before she, the dad is like, okay, okay, calm down. You've been going on about this. But you don't understand. Something held the doors late and it tried to kill me. There was carbon. He's, she's like, look, 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 look. Listen, I know the kid is freaking you out, but there's no reason to do this. Like, why would you drive that? She's like, yeah, but I had to because I was getting, no, no, honey, honey, please. Just go to bed. We're going to talk about this later. You just want to grab this guy by his fucking shirt. 
bitch slap him twice, three times across. Would you listen, please? Like, there's no reason she wouldn't just scream at it. Like, shut up! No reason. Completely out of his fucking mind. And this is not... Like, there's no reason why he wouldn't just shut up and listen to her. Because she's clearly upset. There has to... This is not like a teen misbehaving. Why would she ever drive the car through the garage door unless there was a legitimate life and fucking death reason? And maybe... They, they could have maybe given some plausible... Like, at some point established, like... You know you're not supposed to borrow the car. You don't have a license. But still, come on. Like, that would have been the weakest justification ever. Like, in fact, you would have thought the dad would sit down and wait for a real good goddamn explanation for why the garage door is obliterated. But she's like, she's like, he's like, no, no, honey, go to bed. Go, would you please? Like, I don't want to hear any of your more ghosts, any more of your stories. Would you please? Why does he keep interrupting her? This makes no fucking sense. Especially since she has it on tape. Like, even if he didn't believe any of these ghost stories, which he should, considering a fucking knife dropped from the ceiling and embedded itself two inches in the fucking Formica. Like, don't you think he would maybe have, like, even the slightest interest in these ghost stories that she's been talking about, especially since something completely unexplainable happened to him the night before? Like, how dense is this motherfucker? It's, it's so ridiculous that there's no real character on the planet who would, who would not stop and listen to this. Like, at least listen to the explanation, even if he thought it was ridiculous. Especially since she has a recording of it. All she had to do is be like, would you just wait? I'm going to call this guy over who can get the footage and he will show you. There's no explanation. And that's what I mean when I say this story is just like, these people are like Martians. They're completely unrelatable. You know? And this is, this movie is where, uh, the 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 omnipresent recording just completely fails like they actually came up with really good explanations for why the camera has been set up in various rooms in all three of the movies beforehand the third one it was the weakest but they're like okay the first one weird shit is going down and the guy really wants to record it because he's just interested and you're like okay i buy that the second movie, someone broke into their house and trashed the place, so they install a really super fly high tech surveillance system, and the surveillance system is what catches the shit. The third one is basically the same thing. The guy is like, Man, there's weird shit going on. I saw something in my house, so I want to get this because it's fucked up. I want to get this. The fourth, the fourth movie is some weird shit's going on, and it's actually a logical progression because in modern day, we have cameras everywhere we have them in our laptops we have them in our ipads we have them in our cell phones for christ's sake we have cameras in everything so it makes sense that we have almost omnipresent recording devices at our disposal but even here they push it way too far because she goes um she she goes on on basically skype web chat with her boyfriend a lot which is also kind of strange considering he drives over all the time but whatever so it turns out that he's actually been recording her s Skype calls, which, for some reason, she keeps open and running all night long before she knows anything weird is happening. She keeps this, like, and she's like, why would you record our Skype chat calls? Like, you were watching me sleep? And he's like, no, well, yeah, but that's not the point. And I'm like, why would she leave the fucking chat open when she's sleeping? She, Because she does. And I almost, this this sounds rapey, but, like, why would she leave the chat open? Like, maybe she forgot, but even, like, that's not the sort of thing you would forget because your laptop is open and fucking glowing at night, and it doesn't make any sense. And plus, this guy, by the way, fucking creepy, recording her sleep. Yeah. Anyway, so he's like, that's not the point. I'm like, it is? And he's like, no, no, no. Um, he's like, point is, something weird happened when you were sleeping. And she's like, 
okay, fucking show me. So he scales up, and sure enough, the creepy kid, like, stands in her doorway for hours and then climbs into bed with her and starts, like, feeling her. And right there, like, she goes to her parents and, like, dude, the creepy kid, the creepy kid came into my room and started, like, grabbing my titties and stuff like that. And the parents, of course, are like, yeah, well... Look, the kid is disturbed. He just saw his mother got loaded into an ambulance. He's going to be stressed. He's going to want company when he sleeps. And I'm like, you got to talk to this kid and be like, Robbie, you can't go climbing into people's beds. It's fucking scary and creepy. Like, just stay in your own room, okay? They never do this. Um, And they use that excuse. Look, Robbie just saw his mom get taken off in an ambulance. He's scared. They do that like four times in this movie. Of course, completely disregarding the compl- you know, legitimate concerns of the kid, which she has on tape. Because, like, several times during the course of these nights, the kid fucking gets out of his bed and starts staring at the blank wall, talking to the demon. All but, again, all but speaking to this demon in fucking... in fucking Babylonian. You know, like, in saying really creepy shit. Like... Yes, they're asleep, my lord and master. They are completely oblivious to your greatness. Soon, the eighth, the eighth portal to hell will open and you will come and subjugate these feeble mortals sitting on a throne of blood. Like, this fucking shit happens. She has it on tape, or she has it recorded, and she doesn't show them. She doesn't show them, because I guess I wouldn't show them either, because they'd be like, oh, he's fucking scared. Her mother just got loaded into an ambulance. We all talk to imaginary demons when we see that. I did. Back to the recording, where this thing completely falls apart. So, this weird shit keeps happening. She sees it happening on the recorded hard drive, and she's like, shit. This weird stuff is happening all over the house. So, can you set up... I know, it was a scary movie. She's like, can you set up, set it up so every laptop in the house records continuously because I need to see this? And I'm like, no. Don't believe it. Because not only, like, conveniently, there are, like, five laptops in the house and really good ones. They even throw, they have a throwaway line in there to explain why there's really good laptops all over the house. There's one in her room. There's one in the kids' room. And they're like, why is why do the kids have such a good laptop? And she's like, she's like, oh well, when I got a new one, I had a really good one before, and so they got my hand me down. There's a laptop in the kitchen because the mom likes to have a laptop open so she can look at recipes. I'm like, no. There's there's a camera. I don't even know where this fucking camera comes from, but in the uh, in the like the living room where the video game system is, there's a laptop set up there. And, like, th- there's, like, five cameras, and not counting the cell phone camera, the the laptop that she brings with her that has the Skype chat, and the actual camera camera that the boyfriend carries around. And I'm like, no, this this is dumb. And if you've ever used a computer in your life, you would know how silly this is, because let's say you had a camera rolling all day, every day, and all night, every night, just try to do the, just even the loosest math. Try to figure out how big those fucking video files would be, even rendered in low quality. And this is taking place over the course of like 20 days. Okay, maybe 15, but even so. Low qu- there's like no fucking, uh, no fucking uh, Apple laptop is going to hold that much footage, Ever. It just does not happen. And especially, this is high-quality footage as well. So, like, we're not dealing with low-res footage. We're dealing with, like, you know, movie-quality shit. So, goddamn, I can't record off my desktop for more than an hour and not rack up, like, 30 gigs of fucking video files. Like, no way does this happen. So, right away, completely unbelievable. Not only that, like, there's, like, two cameras in the house that can record infrared. I actually priced out a camera that can record infrared. It was like, the cheapest one I could find was $1,100. And I'm like, no way 
is there, there's no laptop that I can think of that has an infrared camera. Second, to even have a handheld DV cam that has infrared, no fucking way Robbie dropped $1,100, $1,200 on this fucking thing. And there's just no way, you know. And there's, by the way, no video camera around is going to hold 24 hours of footage. Like, I could probably run mine on the lowest quality for, like, on the outside, eight. You know. So unless he was running in every eight hours to change cards, not buying it. And again, uh, even in number three, that really stretched because the most you can get out of a uh, VHS tape is six hours if you have it on the lowest quality. So I, I think they actually did establish that he was legit every six hours changing the tapes. But uh, there's also this weird thing, and I have no idea if this is true or not. It probably is. But they get so much mileage out of the, uh, apparently the Connect shoots out, like, thousands and thousands of infrared beams that make, like, this uh, little points, almost like a planetarium, and these little points all over the place that you can see if the lights are off and you have an infrared camera. So it's a really cool-looking effect, and they, they do it, like, every night to catch the ghosts, like, walking around. I know. It's fucking spooky. So, you know, the, it, it, if it's really true, I should see if I, I don't have an infrared camera. I can't afford one, you know. Um... I actually have one on my wish list. I'm like, I will, I am never going to buy this because when will I ever use it? So like, you have to wonder why this kid is like, I need an infrared camera because I need to watch my girlfriend sleep or some shit. I don't know. So, um, yeah, it, it's the the, it's completely unbelievable. Um, oh, the demon. This demon is so fucking weird now. It, its motivations are completely out. Um, for some reason. The the demon has has consistently been shown that it's able to disrupt electronics because the camera will start to fail. Like in in the previous movies, the camera will fail, the TV will start going to static, the lights will flicker on and off, and and yet when this happens in the house in this movie, the laptops stay on, the laptops keep recording, and I'm like, well, why did the lights go out and the laptop stayed on? And you're like, well, maybe the demon wanted to be seen. No, it doesn't because. Weird shit starts happening, and the kid goes into a room, you know, like, a fucking chandelier falls, and the kid is like, Toby doesn't like you watching us, and then runs off, you know. And I'm like, well, if Toby doesn't like you watching them, why doesn't Toby take his fucking ethereal hand and close the laptops? Why doesn't Toby, like, grab up the camera that's watching him at all times and smash it against the fucking wall? There's no reason why it wouldn't if Toby don't like being watched. And it's like it's not like Toby has anything to fear, which leads me to my next point. Why is Toby just straight up fucking around with the people now? Like in the earlier movies, you can kind of buy it because the the go I, like I justify it to myself anyway by saying, okay, there's a demon around, but it's not like fully into this world. It can't really interact directly with the with the with the real world because maybe it can only do it for a few seconds at a time. It's maybe trying to freak them out to lower their resistances. Or it can only have a legitimate connection to this world if it possesses somebody. So, like, maybe it can't interact with everything that much. It can only interact for any long period of time if it possesses somebody, which is why it possesses Katie, you know. So, like, that's kind of the... the, I, I, I dug that. In the first three movies... The demon doesn't really have that much of a physical presence, so it can only kind of fuck around with things. Like, it can slam doors, it can lure people to where it it has, you know, it can lure people around so it can ambush them, because it doesn't have that much strength or something. That's how I justified it to myself, and it made sense that way. In this movie, we have long ago established that Katie has been absolutely and uncontrollably possessed by this demon because twice now we have seen katie just outright straight up thug thug fuck up people like when she fucking hurled mika across the room ass first into the camera when we saw katie fucking show the uh the girl from the second movie like right through the fucking ceiling you're like jesus christ this demon has made her like some kind of fucking wonder woman so like why? Oh, I, I got a back a little bit. This, oh, th- this is another thing that fucking just infuriated me. Okay, in the second movie, it's established that there's this, the whole witchcraft thing, 
Um, what the demon ultimately wants is the firstborn male child of the family, because there's some kind of deal with Satan that kind of went on. So the demon wants the first male-born child, and the kid's name is Hunter. Okay, So the entire second movie, the demon is trying to get a hold of Hunter. And it ends with Katie doing the show where you can, and taking the kid, and leaving. You know, So, okay, so the Katie has Hunter, walks off, and you're like, wow, why is Katie now fucking with this new family in the fourth movie? This is where I almost walked out of the theater. I, I was so mad. Okay, here's what happens. It Okay, big spoilers. Not even that huge a spoiler, but whatever. What It turns out that the kid that Katie got was not Hunter. It turns out that Hunter is the adopted child in the new family in 4. Apparently, Katie got the wrong kid. This movie took the entire concept of the second movie and punted. It punted to a fifth movie. Blatantly and inexcusably, it essentially retconned Paranormal Activity 2 by saying, oh, all that shit that happened in 2, completely pointless, because that wasn't the actual kid. No, this is the kid here, and there's so many plot holes that that opens, and maybe I just was so mad I wasn't paying attention. I, I don't think that's the case, but maybe I just missed the part that explained every single plot hole that raises. Why? Why in the name of fucking Christ, why would the original family give up Hunter for adoption? Why? It doesn't make any sense considering they have a kid and that kid is named Hunter. Did like, did they, did that family have a kid and not like the kid and take it back to the hospital and they're like, this kid is defective. Can we trade it in for a new one? And they handed it, what, what the fuck? That doesn't make any fucking sense. And then, like, why if, if the family in the fourth movie had a kid, they had Alex... Why would they feel compelled to adopt when it's been shown that they could have kids? Did something happen? Which is never explained? Did, why? And why, in this movie, if they only have one little kid, do they have bunk beds? And this isn't the sort of thing where, like, oh, maybe, maybe the girl and, um, <sighs> Oreo... It's not the sort of thing where, like, maybe Alex and the kid were little kids at the same time, so they slept in bunk beds. There's no way, because, like, like Wyatt is, like, fucking seven. So there's no reason they would have bunk beds. And this is the sort of thing I nitpick about, like, crazy. But there's there's no reason for it. it, it they only have bunk beds because they can't, they don't have two beds in the I, I Why would they give the kid up for adoption and still have a kid? Why would they, why would the other family adopt a kid if they already had a kid? It doesn't make any fucking sense. And it so pisses me off that, like, why would the demon even stalk the second family if Hunter was not in that family? Like, did the family know about this and try to psych out the demon with a fake Hunter? Like, did they give the original Hunter for adoption, then, they like, adopt another kid and named it Hunter so the demon wouldn't know? I don't think so, because in the second movie... Nobody in the family knows that there's a demon after them. I don't understand any of this. And it's so needlessly complicated. This movie should have wrapped up with the... It should have wrapped up with the third, but it should have definitely wrapped up with the fourth, where there's finally some kind of answer, some kind of confrontation. But no, it, like, it punts. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. We gotta, the real Hunter is, is abducted in this movie, and then in the fifth movie, we're going to show you what the fuck happened. You can't punt. <laughs> it's like fourth down in this movie, and they punt. It's so fucking stupid. I get worked up. I'm going to get a fucking ulcer watching these goddamn movies. <sighs> okay. The jump scares. This movie is almost all jump scares. Whereas, 
in the first movie, whereas in all the movies previous to this, the jump scares were restrained. There were only a few. They... And... There were only a few. Okay? And I know that's hypocritical of me to say because almost all the paranormal movies are kind of based on the jump scare. But to me, it was much more restrained. It still looked kind of real. Um, and it had legitimacy because, again, this sounds stupid, but there were no loud orchestra stings. You know, to me, the loud orchestra sting is, is the yelling in the ear of these movies. They didn't have that, and I really thought the jump scares in, this movie, in that movie were earned. Three, a little too much, but whatever. In the fourth movie, there are so many fucking jump scares, and they are the most predictable, cliché jump scares. For instance, they like she goes downstairs, and she sees a chandelier swinging, and you're like, okay, they're distracting us with that one chandelier, they're drawing your eye over here, so another chandelier can fall, and like, sure enough, a chandelier falls. And almost like, right on cue. I can call this shit. Um... You know, it, it's, and it's basically because we've kind of sussed out the paranormal activity formula where it draws your eye over here and then something flies out over here. It, we've seen this trick like three movies already. We can kind of call it, and you do. You call virtually every single scare. There's a few ones that are really, really good. Like when they turn around in the treehouse and they see the kids stand there like fucking Blair Witch. Good one. There's a few really good ones. But there's a lot of really bad ones. And they do the most cliche... This is the second time I do it. The most cliched, hackneyed, jump scare of them all. Cat. They do the cat scare. And they do the cat scare twice. Fucking twice. The cat leaps out and scares them. I'm like, fuck you. Fuck you with your jump scare bullshit. They actually do the cat. Virtually none of the characters are likable. Um, you know, the second family was really good. They had the dog, and you're like, you're actually really invested in the dog's fate. Uh, it, it's ironic that the two characters you care about are the are the the boyfriend and girlfriend characters because the boyfriend, like I said, is really great. Oreo is squeaking on a toy because I'm not paying attention to her. So, where the fuck was I? Um, yeah, they do a lot with the connect, and I guess I'll wrap up. I'm, I'm just rambling about the fucking jump scares. Oh, another thing that really, really fucking detracts from the, the, the legitimacy of this movie, where you just completely stop buying that it's real, is they do, like, they, they actually start to reference several other horror movies, and when you do that, it takes you right out of it. Right out of it. For instance, there's a scene with a basketball bouncing down the stairs and all of a sudden stopping. Because that's what the demon would do. The demon would fucking dribble down a set of stairs and then stop. Ooh. That really plays into the demon's diabolical plan. And there's another one where the kid, like one of the kids, is like pedaling around the house on this little like recumbent tricycle which is exactly the thing that happens in The Shining when the kid is, like, pedaling down the halls on this tricycle thing. And I'm like, you know, I'm not fucking stupid. I know where this comes from. And you're just reminding me at, at every turn this is a fucking movie. It's not at, like, there's no way I can possibly buy this is found footage anymore. Um, this is the squeaky toy, and the Oreo is the, this is the scariest thing in this movie. Um... The ending is where... The ending. Fucking silly. The ending has always been the weak point of all the movies, I think. Um, where... Where that's that's where, like, the really fucking scary shit happens. And that's usually where the, the really indefensible cinematic crap happens. With, like, the demon face in the first one. Uh, pretty much the demon face in all of them. You know. Um, in this one, the ending just goes absolutely out of its mind. Where... Um, like I said, uh, it finally reaches a point... Oh, oh, I remember... I, okay, my tangent. Uh, I was going on about why the... Uh, why if... If the demon was weaker before until it possessed Katie, it has now possessed Katie, 
in the fourth movie. We have established that Katie is like this superhuman possessed entity that can show Ryukin you so hard it fucking kills you. Okay? This has been established. Why in the fourth movie, if, if Katie wants this kid, why does she not immediately, like from frame one, fucking pump kick the door open and start snapping necks like Steven Seagal? There's no reason why she wouldn't. From, from fucking frame one, like if she wants this kid, she could go in there, she's fucking invulnerable. She would, and even if she's not, like if she could be legit killed... She would take this family so by surprise, There's, it's clear they're not armed in any way. She could walk in there and just fucking brutalize this entire family, and there's no reason why she couldn't. And ironically enough, at the, uh, at, in the third act, that's exactly what she does. She, just, she essentially just walks in the house and fucking murders everybody. And I'm like, okay, what took you so long? Why would you do this thing where fucking Toby is like dribbling basketballs, playing Connect late at night? And they they try to explain it where like oh they have to make they have to make Hunter ready for his possession for his for his final absorption into the cult and like well why doesn't why doesn't Katie just kill everybody abduct the kid and then indoctrinate him into the family over there like why doesn't she just kill everybody pile them into a car and move somewhere else where she could have full twenty four seven access to them and it makes no sense. So I was actually really happy when Katie just was like, fuck it, I'm, I'm a fucking demon and starts killing everybody. And so what is the fucking dumbest thing that the, the kid can do when this starts happening? She goes, like, she's out of the house when all this happens, okay? And so she's like, she comes home and she finds her boyfriend with his head fucking twisted around. And so she's like, oh my god, oh my god, Hunter's been kidnapped! So she goes out and she sees Katie walking into this, this house, or her house across the street. And so, what's the dumbest thing she could possibly do? Instead of calling the cops? No. She chases Katie across the goddamn street and runs into their house. And she dies. Big shock. Because when she gets into the house, Katie goes full fucking demon on her and kills her. Da, 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 da. Like, how fucking dumb are you, girl? Call the cops. Ninjas, TV, demons, cops. And I'm not saying, like, like oh, no, she wa- she had to get Hunter right away because, like, she didn't have time to call the cops. Bullshit. What's she gonna do? She's 15 years old. What's she gonna... You've seen her boyfriend with, her, with his head fucking twisted. Her. What are you gonna do? Because you've seen this... You've seen this fucking demon, like, throw shit all over the place. Your parents are fucking dead. Um, like, what are you gonna do? You call the cops, you get him out of here. She's not going anywhere. She's in the house. And even if she piles in the car, you can find her. The cops are very good at finding people with a helicopter. It works out great. So, goddamn, retard... And this is, like, she has, even when she goes in, she sees her dad being, like, run through the house by this invisible fucking force. Like, being ping-ponged across the walls. Like, this demon is just slamming him left and right and eventually, like, fucking kills him and they disappear into this room, right? And, like, even then, like, she has a chance to get out of there. There's no fucking... Re- like, she might... She she has to realize, like, oh my god, I stand no chance against this bullshit unless I have a cross-soaked in olive oil. First movie. Psst, bullshit. And where it gets... I keep saying this, too. Oreo, go get your... Sweet... And the worst part of the scene is she tapes it, or she records it. How? She has her camera phone out, and even when her parents are getting murdered in front of her face, she has her camera phone out, and she runs through the house, and even when Katie fucking goes demon face on her, camera's still out. She's in mortal fucking danger. See, she's smashing a window to get out of this house. Camera phone in her left hand. The first question, the second question, the first question you have to ask in a found footage movie is why are they taping it? The second question is how are they taping it? The third question is when the shit starts to go down, why don't they put the camera down? You ha- I, I actually started writing a screenplay. And before I realized how cliche this whole thing has become, I started it out 
as a found footage movie. It is no longer a found footage movie, this thing I'm writing. And the reason is, when people start to die, cameras are off. You know, when, it, it, it depends a little bit, but like, when people start to legit die, like straight up just get murdered, like Steven Seagal neck snapping, or like, people are in, are in danger, knives start getting thrown around, the cameras, are, uh, the cameras should go off. The police really should be contacted. Or somebody needs to be called in on this shit, because this is fucking insane. So, like, I can appreciate her wanting to document this. But when the parents are getting killed right in front of her, you throw the camera down. You call the cops, you know. So, in the screenplay I was writing, same problem. Think shit, got, shit starts getting real, and... This is even a case where they really would keep the cameras rolling because in this movie it's like a it's like a, a laboratory experiment. It's they're they're doing an experiment and it's important they tape them 24/7. But when people start dying, it's time to call the cops. You know, the 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 experiment is over. You know, you would not keep taping this unless it was for legal purposes, but the, like I said, people are dying, it's over. You know, there's no reason you wouldn't drop the phone. And not only does she not drop the phone, it's perfectly stable. It's on, like, a fucking steady cam. She has all the shots perfectly framed at all times, even when, like, the fucking demons have surrounded her. There's more than one now. In fact, there's, like, a fucking thousand of them, but whatever. That last shot in the movie is really weird. But, like, at no, like you throw the fucking... Oh, there's another one. This was hilarious to me. Okay, She's in the garage, and the demon traps her in the garage. It fucking slams the garage door shut. It somehow holds the other garage door shut that leads back into the house. It turns the car on and starts to fill the room with carbon monoxide, okay? And you're like, so she's in big trouble, and the reason there's a camera on her is because she's, she's on a video chat with her boyfriend, and she's carrying the laptop around, okay? Fair enough. So when the room starts filling up with the carbon monoxide, she puts the camera, she puts the laptop on the floor. I'm like, okay. Then she starts to try the door. Door is ho the door is closed. So, then she's like, I gotta get in the car. So, she runs past the laptop, and on her way past the laptop, she spins it around, she spins the whole laptop around to look at the car. I laughed so hard at that. Bullshit. Fucking bullshit. I, I was like, she's in mortal danger. She's trapped in a room that's filling with poison gas. She turns the laptop around to look at her. Oh my god, have you spent the last shred of Suspension of disbelief this movie series ever had. Wow. So dumb. So amazingly dumb. This is what I'm talking about when I say it's, there's no way you can believe this. There's none. It, it, it's a straight-up slasher movie. It, it's, it's a slasher movie from this point on. And maybe you're okay with that, but the thing is, that the formula established in the Paranormal Activity movies only works so long as you believe it's found footage. It is no longer found footage. And I, this is the last real problem I have with the movie. I will stop here on this movie. But the reason I say, even if you were to buy that they recorded all this shit, Let's just say they recorded all this shit, and for some reason, conveniently, she spins the laptop around as she's dying. She she still has her camera phone in her hand. Even if you believe that happened, once again the question is raised. Who got this footage, and who edited it? Okay, the first question. All this shit's been recorded on apparently her infinite laptop storage space. But let's say the documentarian's got a hold of this. Did they also edit this? Because, why would they edit it like a horror movie? Here's, how, here's what I mean. First movie, second movie, even the third movie. 
when weird shit starts happening, like really weird shit, when people start getting sucked out of their beds or sheets start getting thrown around or things start collapsing, you know, when things are going on, you see it. And I know that sounds weird. You actually see everything that happens. In this movie, this is the best example I can think of. In this movie, the demon actually, like, walks into her room, and she's in bed, okay? Alex is in bed. What happens is, like Zool in fucking Ghostbusters, she starts to, like, float over her bed like some unseen arms are picking her up, and she's, like, suspended three feet over her bed. So she's being held there over her bed like something is about to, like, snap her in half. She's floating there. And then we cut to the, then we cut, just like, bam, we cut to the living room where the connect is set up. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're cutting? You're doing an edit in the middle of the girl floating above her bed. What, did you think that wasn't interesting enough? We have to cut to the fucking connect? We have to cut to the fucking living room where nothing is happening? Did you, did you think we'd get bored? Like, if this were real, would you not think that we would want to see the evidence of the paranormal of this girl somehow floating over her fucking bed? Why would you edit? It may, and they do this several fucking times. We're like, like, you know, there's a kid in a pool. The, the kid is taking a bath. And this, by the way, raises so many weird questions about the ethicality this girl has of recording her family 24-7, including the potential for watching the little children undress. Anyway, this is another jump scare that's completely telegraphed, because the kid's sitting in a, in a bathtub, you're like, he's going to get sucked under the water. He's going to get sucked. Yep, there it goes. He's sucked under the water. This is another huge plot hole. The mom is giving the kid a bath. So in the middle of the bath, she's like, Wait a minute, I need to go downstairs and get something. Bullshit. Bullshit. Like, unless this mom is the worst mom ever, you never leave a kid as young as that in a pool or a bathtub alone. Never. Never. Never, ever. My mom didn't leave me in any sizable body of water until I was, like, fucking 16. Now, was it, was it, uh, was it too much? Yeah. You know, it was, it was over much that, but she wanted me safe. If I was fucking six, no. I was never alone in the pool. I was never alone, uh, I mean, uh, I was never alone in the pool. I, I can't, I, I was taking my own baths, I think, but like, she would check up on, like, I, I don't even remember, but my point is, like, there, if she was giving him a bath, okay, if she was doing that, she should never leave the kid alone. It would never happen. I'm, goddamn, never ha I can't even remember if my mom was giving me baths at that age, but if she were, no. In fact, given how paranoid she was about me drinking, she probably did. But, you know, at some point I started taking showers, you know. And, you know, honestly, I, yeah, actually, I think I think by that age, I might have actually been taking showers. I wasn't taking baths. But, like, shower, she'd let me go, you know. But, yeah, if there was a bath, any kind of size, well, no, no, no. But, um, where was I with this? Uh, <laughs> I keep going on tangents. Oh, the editing. So, like, the kid gets sucked under the water. He's not, like, whatever it is is not letting him surface. He's down there for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. But before we get to 40 seconds, uh, actually, like at 20 seconds, we cut. We cut down to the kitchen where we see the mom, like, getting a sandwich. And I'm like, okay, they're establishing that the mom is nowhere to be seen. We cut back to the, to the bathtub. It's like 30 seconds now. Then we cut back to the kitchen where she's still making a fucking sandwich. I'm like, you know what? Point made. She's... She's a bad mom, and she's making a fucking sandwich. But, like, why would we not stick with the paranormal? Why would we not watch the paranormal activity that's going on? And this happens, like, virtually every fucking time we see anything weird happen in this house. 
in the middle of it, we cut. Not only that, sometimes we don't even go back to it. There, this is a perfect example. She, Alex is floating over her bed. We cut to the family room where nothing is happening. And then we cut to the next morning. We cut to the next morning where Alex is once again laying in her bed. What the fuck? Did you not think we'd be interested to see how she got down? Like, okay, I know it's implied she gets down, but this is paranormal activity. We would like to maybe see the paranormal activity this movie speaks of. In the first movie, in all the movies previously, we see it. Like, if Katie got sucked out of the bed, we see where she gets sucked off to. That came out weird. We see where she gets pulled to. We see Mika, like, grab her and pull her back. We see the paranormal shit happening. I don't know why the fuck you went... The only reason you would edit it is to make it, like... Is to make it a horror movie. Where it's completely artificial now. So, that's where I'm coming from. Like, as soon as I say there's any artifice going on with these movies, movie's out the window. Movie is done. There's no... Why would you ever watch this? Because it's boring, it's slow, it's cont- it's completely predictable, and there's no believing it. There's no way to believe any of it. There's no way to... It's over. It's over. The series is over. So the, the series is f- once and firmly dead.